Hi, my name is Josh, and today we're going to be talking through some of the pathophysiology of end-stage liver disease. So what is end-stage liver disease? It starts with cirrhosis. Uh, cirrhosis is really a pathologic diagnosis based upon liver biopsy. It's the final common pathway of almost all etiologies of chronic liver disease. And that biopsy shows that the liver has developed fibrosis and regenerative nodules, and these together distort the hepatic architecture and vasculature. Now, end-stage liver disease is really just all the downstream pathophysiologic manifestations of these changes. People have different frameworks or algorithms for thinking through liver disease patients. One that I like is this VIBES acronym because it really nicely illustrates some of these sequelae. That stands for volume, infection, bleeding, encephalopathy, and then some basic screening tools. Let's go ahead through it. So, from a volume standpoint, most of what we try to manage is ascites. Now, ascites, first you want to develop uh, a diagnosis that it's actually portal in etiology. You do this by doing a diagnostic parasyntesis and looking at the serum ascites albumin gradient. And if this is greater than 1.1, then you have a 97% accuracy uh, that it's portal in etiology. The other thing to note about ascites, it does carry a grim prognosis. Of, uh, at the time of ascites development, patients only have a 30 to 40 percent five-year survival. In terms of management, I like to think about it on a spectrum where you start with medical management and then move on to maybe procedural management and then consider surgical management. So medical management focuses mostly around the use of diuretics. The most commonly used ones are Lasix and Aldactone in combination. These aren't used together because they're some magic diuretic combination, but more so because Lasix is a potassium wasting diuretic, Aldactone is a potassium sparing diuretic, so together they maintain normal kalemia. And the ratio that does this best is 2 to 5. So oftentimes you'll see somebody started on a dose of Lasix 20, Aldactone 50, or maybe 40 and 100. Uh, and the doses can be up titrated from there to achieve adequate diuretic effect. Now what is, what is that adequate diuretic effect? It can be based upon a couple of things, clinical exam, symptoms, uh, lab work, and one of the lab tools that can be useful is the urine sodium. Uh, here's how. So if a patient has very high urine sodium, um, then it suggests that they're naturalizing well. They're pouring out a lot of sodium into their urine. Uh, and this means that the diuretic probably is working. If the patient has very low urine sodium, it means they are not putting sodium into their urine, and it means they likely need an up titration of their diuretic dose. The max dose that we usually think about is 160 of Lasix and 400 of Aldactone on a daily basis. A couple caveats. One, if the person isn't following a low sodium diet, which is all, what all these patients are prescribed, it's very difficult to interpret those urine sodium values. Um, second, uh, the other reason that a person could fail diuresis, besides having a low urine sodium and a low clinical response in spite of max up titration, is if they have hepatorenal syndrome, um, HRS. And that means that when you attempt to diurese them, they develop recurrent acute kidney injury. If a person fails medical management, then they need to move on to consideration of procedural management. And this is either via a large, recurrent large volume paracentesis which is direct drainage of the fluid from the ascites space, or, and this is especially helpful if the patient has concurrent renal disease, renal replacement therapy. And this can either be in the form of CVVH or HD. If a patient's on CVVH, they need to be in the hospital. Um, and renal uh, liver patients often have a difficult time tolerating hemodialysis due to the large fluid shifts. So both of these renal replacement therapy options can sometimes be difficult. If a patient has failed medical and procedural therapy, then they can be considered for surgical management, which would be a TIPS procedure, which stands for transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunting. And basically, this, this surgery, what it does is it channels through the liver and creates an artificial tunnel that brings the blood prehepatically to posthepatically and skips over all that fibrosis and nodulation that we discussed earlier. It can be very helpful, um, but it's worth saying that these are complicated procedures that can have, um, can have procedural side effects, one of which is uh, increased risk of encephalopathy, which we'll discuss further.
So that's volume management. Next, let's look at infection. There's two things I think about for infection in end-stage liver patients. One is little SBP. This is the more simple one. This is secondary bacterial peritonitis. And it's when bacteria from the outer surface of the body will track into the peritoneal space and infect the ascites. This can be in somebody who has recurrent LVPs and has breaks in the skin, or really any other cut in the skin or portal from the outside to the inside. The, antiba uh, the antibacterial strategy here is the same as if somebody had a skin or soft tissue infection. Um, in terms of the much more common uh, infection we think about, this is big SBP, or spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. And currently we estimate that about 10 to 30 percent of hospitalized patients with end-stage liver disease at any time do have SBP. The pathophysiology here is, as the name says, spontaneous. Bacteria in the gut lumen will translate, uh, translocate over to the lymph nodes uh, and from here to the bloodstream and subsequently infect the ascites space. So antibacterials are aimed at uh, gut flora. We'll talk about three things here. Prophylaxis, diagnosis of active SBP, and then treatment. So prophylaxis, there's two groups that need prophylaxis. Secondary prophylaxis, anybody who's had SBP before needs continued prophylaxis. And primary prophylaxis um, is based upon a diagnostic paracentesis. Anybody who has an ascites fluid total protein less than 1 or an ascites fluid total protein less than 1.5 with concurrent kidney disease. All these patients need prophylaxis against SBP. That's generally done with a fluoroquinolone. We like to use norfloxacin, uh, but Bactrim or other antibiotics can be used based upon sensitivity data in that patient. For diagnosis of active SBP, there's a couple ways it can be done. First, if the person has a positive gram stain or culture of their ascites fluid, that obviously needs treatment, and you can guide your therapy based upon the culture data. Or somebody can have culture negative SBP, um, meaning the culture doesn't turn out positive, but they do have more than 250 PMNs on their cell count. Functionally, the way that you figure this out is you take the total number of nucleated cells on the ascites cell count, and you multiply it by the fraction of those cells, which are neutrophils. If that end number is greater than 250, then the person is diagnosed with SBP. It's worth saying that there's a third group who merits treatment doses for SBP, and those are people who have a history of SBP and concurrent active GI bleed. This makes sense because of the pathophysiology we discussed with the gut translocation. These patients are at such high risk to begin with given their history, and then they're at even higher risk for SBP when they're actively GI bleeding, that they merit treatment. So what is that treatment? First, obviously antibiotics. Usually we use cefotaxime or ceftriaxone or a cephalosporin equivalent, um, so, although sometimes fluoroquinolones are used or even other drugs based upon uh, sensitivity data or allergies. And then the other thing that's used is albumin. This is based upon a 1999 New England Journal study, which showed that when 1.5 grams per kilogram of albumin was given on day one of antibiotics, and one gram per kilogram was given on day three of antibiotics, that there was a reduction in mortality. And most of this was via HRS, hepatorenal syndrome, reduction, reduced mortality. So that is to say that although we typically take this strategy in all hospitalized patients who are diagnosed with SBP, it's most critical in doing it in the patients who have uh, underlying renal disease or even frank HRS. That's infection. Let's go ahead and talk about bleeding. Bleeding, again, can be broken down into two different categories. The first is varices, or esophageal variceal bleeding, and the next is coagulopathy. From a variceal standpoint, first, for diagnosis, anybody who has cirrhosis needs an EGD um, at diagnosis in terms of classifying their variceal standpoint. If that's positive, then ideally they get Q one year repeat EGDs for screening. Uh, from a therapeutic standpoint, I'll start by saying that we're not going to talk about some of the procedural options, banding and such, that are available for these patients, nor are we going to go into the management of emergent esophageal variceal bleeding. 
um, which is a totally different discussion. From a long-term management strategy, typically what we use is a non-selective beta blocker, such as natalol. Uh, what this does is not only reduce the heart rate, but the non-selective component of the blockade blocks adrenergic dilation of the mesenteric arterioles that feed these varices. And when you, when you block this, you have unopposed alpha constriction, which will lead to decreased variceal blood flow. And when you decrease the blood flow, you decrease the risk of variceal bleeding. From a coagulopathy standpoint, many patients with end-stage liver disease do have uh, coagulopathy. And this is usually due to the underlying um, cirrhosis uh, and lack of synthetic function. But patients often do have malnourishment as well. And every patient with a coagulopathy with end-stage liver disease warrants a vitamin K trial. Typically, we give three days in a row to see if there's a response. If there is a response, it may have meant there's some nutritional component, and this patient might warrant vitamin K treatment going forward. Next, we'll talk about encephalopathy. So encephalopathy is basically when ammonia, or NH3, that is typically cleared by the liver, now due to this dysfunction, gets portosystemically shunted. Uh, and this ammonia has direct toxic effects on the brain. So it's worth starting by saying that some people uh, wonder if it's worth trending ammonia or checking ammonia for a diagnosis of encephalopathy. Although it can be helpful sometimes to check a recurrent value over time in, in a single patient, generally ammonia, both arterial and venous, is felt to be unreliable for a diagnosis of encephalopathy. And this is mainly a clinical diagnosis. What are some of the things that can lead to the diagnosis of new or recurrent encephalopathy? There's many, many things that can. Some of the most common ones that we see in practice are electrolyte disturbance or dehydration, uh, a large protein load into the GI lumen, which leads to subsequent absorption of the NH3 in that protein and portosystemic shunting of that NH3. The one we worry about most with respect to a protein load is a new GI bleed because the blood in the tract will have a large protein component. Infection. Any infection can cause encephalopathy development, but SBP is the one we are especially concerned about. Sedative medications, which are commonly given on an inpatient basis. New clot, which these patients are at risk for due to low flow through the um, portal circulation and also due to the coagulopathy. And finally, one that is sometimes overlooked, new HCC, which we'll discuss a little bit more in screening. In terms of management, the two medications we generally use are Lactulose and Rifaximin. Lactulose leads to decrease in fecal pH, which leads to subsequent trapping of NH4 and eventual excretion of NH3. Rifaximin leads to gut decontamination. It's an antibiotic and this leads to increased excretion of NH3. The final thing worth mentioning with respect to encephalopathy is um, if we go back to the pathophysiology, as we heard, it was due to the portosystemic shunting of ammonia. And if we go back to our TIPS procedure, the goal of that procedure was to portosystemically shunt. So as we briefly mentioned earlier, it's, it's really important to think about um, a person's encephalopathy risk factors before proceeding with the TIPS. Because after TIPS, people are incredibly high risk for encephal encephalopathy because any residual NH3 clearance that the liver had is now lost uh, after you tunnel through with the TIPS procedure. Finally, we'll talk about screening. A couple of the most important things to think about. First are the esophageal screening that we discussed here. Uh, next for HCC. So, Everybody with cirrhosis has a 5% annual risk of developing HCC, and these people need to be screened for this development. Uh, from a lab standpoint, we have Q6 month AFP checks, and this is a tumor marker. Uh, and from a radiology standpoint, you can either get Q6 to 12 months red upper quadrant ultrasound or Q12 month liver MRI. Uh, the final thing is that these people have uh, depressed immune systems and are at high risk for infection, so they need to be kept up to date on their vaccines. Um, this, this is flu shot, Pneumovax, 
any other age-appropriate vaccines they may be eligible for. And finally, hepatitis A and hepatitis B immunity status, because a concurrent liver infection in these patients who are already so at risk would be, would be really devastating. So in summary, this is kind of a framework for thinking through liver patients who can be otherwise really quite complicated from a pathophysiology standpoint. But if you break it down and think through each category separately, it can really help to guide your evaluation and your management. Thanks for watching.